So, I suggest we start. So, I'm very excited to, to introduce this uh, first uh, CTA panel discussion. Uh, ben, over to you, and let's start. Yeah, thank you very much, Sergey. So, um, I've, I've got a range of, of questions to run through. I think the first few um, I'll throw to, to each of you individually to answer and give us some background. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go through some further questions kind of um, and, and select someone to answer. But, um, but yeah, I guess if we start with, uh, let's go with Karishma first. If, um, if you could give us a bit more uh, info about you, um, obviously you're all really well known in the ecosystem, but a little bit about who you are and, and maybe something that our audience today won't know about you. Sure, so hi everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Karishma Halwani. Um, it's 1 p.m. here. I'm based out of Los Angeles, and uh, it's it's really hot. Uh, I live in the warmest part of Los Angeles. I'm almost like sweating here, but um, so excited to be here. Um, something that uh, folks won't know about me. So a little bit about me. I started my, um, I, I grew up in Mumbai. Uh, I did my college engineering um, got into Accenture from a job and then came to Los Angeles in 2010. And uh, from a CDA standpoint, I think maybe some know, some don't, but uh, I was probably the fourth woman to get the CDA globally. Uh, this was back in 2015, so five years ago. We are still very few, but it was uh, that back then it was really exciting to, uh, you know, be uh, under 10 to achieve it so that's something about me uh, i guess nice uh, to meet everybody yeah nice so um carl if you could uh, if you could follow that up and tell us uh, a little bit about you and, and something maybe people won't know as well sure ben hi everyone um my name is carl brundage i am a master architect at otis Eva. we're isv partner that provides a lot of uh, customer trust on top of salesforce um, probably the thing that people may not know about me is they, they may think that I've been a Salesforce uh, ecosystem person for a really long time, but I, I actually only started in 2014 and then earned my CTA in 2017. But I spent a lot of years before that doing business intelligence data warehousing solutions at, a, at an OEM and then also about 10 years of delivering CRM software to pharmaceuticals and life sciences. So a lot of experience with the topics, just not necessarily with Salesforce. Sure. And uh, Seb, over to you. Um, um, so, I mean, Sebastian, a lot of you already know me. I'm a certified technical architect, as everybody else here on the panel, and the founder of Global Public. Um, since it's my own company, I can call myself a master coach and a master CTA. No, it's not like <laughs> uh, we actually got the title from someone, so I'm a master as well. Um, something that people don't really know about me. So, uh, first of all, I actually started as an administrator and i had zero clue how to code i was more on the business and the functional side i studied business um, but i taught myself and uh, right after i got my cta i kind of took a sabbatical from from salesforce and i opened up a burrito shop in southern portugal which is why i'm such a big fan of uh, of mexican food and why i'm getting tacos now and that would have been perfect to have the doorbell ring <laughs> I was. I'm glad that was the uh, the the surprise thing because I was hoping you would talk about your burrito bar. So thank you for for doing that. Um, so obviously, being a CTA uh, is an amazing achievement, and it's something a lot of people are striving for. But again, if we go in the same order, what does what does being a CTA actually mean to you, uh, Karishma? So uh, a lot of things. I think for me, the biggest part was going through the journey itself, not so much as much as getting it. Obviously, if you take the exam and you clear it, that's a different level of happiness. But I think the journey of it itself makes you grow as an architect. And uh, I, I remember I spent six months training for it, weekends, 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 and just having that single focus. And I realized how much I didn't know until I started actually uh, getting on to that path. Um, once you get it, obviously you start thinking about problems differently. Um, the, the exam is fantastic in terms of how do you frame your 
thought process, how do you solve a problem? I think a lot of those critical things, which are not even specific to Salesforce technology as such, you learn through that and you just become better at what you do, uh, regardless of what the outcome is. So that was the most exciting thing for me. And Carl? I would definitely echo what Prisma said. For, for me, I think I would also add that after becoming a CTA, I almost feel like I have a sense of responsibility in, in, in being a CTA and, and that comes in two different ways. One is I feel like I need to continue learning. The, the CTA is not the end of the journey. It's just the start of the next leg of the journey. And whether that's learning about adjacent technologies like AWS or new clouds that come out like Commerce Cloud, that's part of it. They can never stop learning because there's always something, if I know, I can provide a better solution to a customer. And the second aspect of the responsibility is, is a need to, to share what I know, not to kind of lock it away in my head and say, hey, look, I'm this great CTA, nobody's going to get any help, but to, to share it in the community, to come to events like this, to write articles and make sure that it's a conversation that has some back and forth, not just this uh, you know, person sitting on a pedestal. Yeah, perfect. I, uh, that's a great way of looking at things. And, um, and Seb, yourself? It's really hard to follow up with those two amazing answers. Um, so I, I think, first of all, I agree with both of you what you what you have said. Um, maybe to add, I think it's really about the process itself. Like let me elaborate a little bit on that. Like the the refinement of your skills, the process itself that you're going through will actually have you come out differently on the other side. And it doesn't really matter if you become a CTA in the end and you pass the exam or not, because just going through. The process itself um, will actually help you shifting your perspective, change your thought process. And once you've achieved it, I think it's also uh, really about like how people are perceiving you. And I'm not talking here about, oh, like that, that great arc, the CTA. It's more about people will argue less with you. You know, like you have a degree of authority uh, where people are like, okay, so that person really knows what they are talking about and they are more open to logical arguments. And just on, on that point as well, is that, is that really um, something you saw in on, only in the Salesforce ecosystem or broader? Like when you're speaking to architects in businesses that aren't from a Salesforce background, do they also kind of appreciate that and, and give you that, um, that platform? Um, so here's the thing, normally when you are a CTA, you brought into project, since we are so few people, you know, like the, we almost get like introduced, oh, and this is the CTA and like they're only like 300 or so. Um, so people have, an, have a sense of appreciation what, what is actually behind it without necessarily grasping um, the, the, full, uh, the full size of it, if you want. Sure. And then um, if we, we really quickly cover um, your, each of your journeys to CTA, so from the moment that you entered the Salesforce ecosystem to becoming a CTA, how long was that? And um, I guess, what would you have done differently if there was a main tip? So, Karishma, Sure, again. so I, um, I want to, um, and I'm glad you asked this because a lot of people have a perception that you need to do X number of years on Salesforce before you even attempt. Uh, Newsflash, I entered the um, Salesforce ecosystem in 2013 and I got my CTA on January of 2015, so less than two years. Wow. Uh, I don't think you can ever time box to say, um, you know, you at least need to have 15 big projects and and be an admin and developer. It, all that doesn't matter. Uh, the reason being um, your concepts need to be strong. So whatever the uh, test challenges you on, whether it's data, whether it's integration, as long as your fundamentals and your concepts are strong, you can actually attempt it uh, in the first two years itself. Obviously, there are a lot more prerequisites, as we all know. Tons of certifications to be given before um, you even try to go to the review board but it's not impossible so if anybody wants to say oh you need to feel ready i can tell you mentoring many people uh, in salesforce nobody can ever be ready for it so you just have to pick a date come up with a plan and just go for it and that's what i did yeah nice and call yeah my my uh, experience i started in the ecosystem in summer of 2014 
And I didn't come in entering with, hey, I'm going to be a CTA. Like that wasn't, wasn't the path or wasn't the journey at all. There was a, a team that I was working for in ISV that they were very technical at the time. They, most of them had six certifications, and I think you could have seven at, at the most at that time. So I wanted to kind of prove myself to them that I was serious about this role coming in from the outside and, and wanted to learn the technology, be able to converse with them. So that started me on my certification journey where I picked up uh, a few at the time and then really found it as a great way to continue learning and test my knowledge. And it probably wasn't until 2016 that I, I just said, hmm. This, this might be possible when the designers came out in the pyramid. And that led to me earning it in the, in the winter, December of 2017. So I was on a fast path as well from a timeline. But what I would say is, if I look back pre-sales first, a lot of the stuff I did prepared me for being a CTA and the review board. If I go back even to high school where I acted in musicals and was on stage, that stage presence and communication, like I'd probably have been on a CTA journey my whole life. I just didn't know it until 2016. <laughs> Everything kind of prepares you to be successful there. Sure, yeah, nice. And uh, finally, Sebastian. Um, so in regards to my journey, I mean, as I mentioned before, I started out as an admin and I was working for that customer uh, started in 2008. At some point, once I had really built everything that I could build in, in the company, I decided to kind of move into consulting and was fortunate enough to start with the company. Um, but actually, after two years from transitioning from that one man uh, sales for show into a consulting role, I actually attempted the board and uh, in the past on the first attempt, thanks to, to all the great learnings that I got from, from my colleagues. Um, and I totally agree. It's like, it's about the concepts that you know, because, because I think, especially for me as an educator, as a coach, um, the, like the, all the technical knowledge I can bang in your head and you can remember that. But if you don't have the concepts necessary to actually make sense of those, of the knowledge that you're getting and applying it in the correct way, it's not going to be, it's not going to happen. No? So sure. asking what I would have done differently, probably, um, not much to, to be honest, <laughs> no, but honestly, but I think, um, learning more of the conceptual things. So understanding the what rather than the how is definitely valuable. Sure. So I've got a few questions that I'm now going to ask individually. Um, but if anyone else has, uh, some really valuable input for that specific question as well, if you could uh, obviously uh, add that, um, Carl, you just mentioned um, certifications and, and I think I, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile. You have 30 or you've passed 30. I'm not sure if some of them have been retired, um, which is, you know, I, I've never seen that before. That's, uh, that's, that's crazy. But on your journey to CTA, how much value were you putting on each of those certifications? And, and obviously now past passing the CTA, how much value do you put on the additional ones that you, pick, you were picking up? I, I look at it as a kind of a, a checkpoint for me to say, do I have the minimum amount of knowledge that I need in this particular area? So if I think about most certifications are designed to say, this is, a, this is what a minimal qualified candidate would possess from a knowledge perspective. So it doesn't mean I'm gonna go in and be the best person ever on marketing cloud or the best B2, B2C developer out there. But I have enough knowledge to, to know where to pull in those things when I'm planning as an architect. So the value for me is, is being able to assess where do I fall versus those expectations to see if I've been successful in my learning or if I need to go back and study more. Because the end goal is to deliver success to customers, right? The people that you're working with, they're entrusting you to build a system that works today and in the future. And, and that's why, why I value the certification so much. And is, is your approach to those certifications like if you're going to be working on a project in those areas, then you would approach that cert beforehand? Or is it something you do after gaining some exposure to it? I've done a lot of them actually as betas. So helping Salesforce prepare for what those qualifications would be. Uh, I'm, I'm usually more interested in learning a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, so I'd like to have some awareness of something before I face it on, on a project rather than trying to react to it. But I don't think there's a wrong way you can do it. It's, it's, learn, it's going with your particular learning style and what works for you. Sure. Okay, nice. Um, and we, we were just, uh, everyone kind of mentioned the concepts that are required and the understanding of concepts to be a CTA. Um, 
And Karishma, you mentioned that, you know, obviously you achieved the CTA relatively quickly, but you had worked um, on big, large scale transformations before you transferred into Salesforce. So how important is that? Yes. And how important is um, scale, complexity? Um, and, and how does someone get those concepts if they've only worked in Salesforce? Sure. So um, my background primarily uh, coming out of college. So I did my computer science. So obviously those concepts were there in terms of coding best practices. Now, once I started working at Accenture, I was actually doing Oracle Siebel, which was another CRM product. Uh, that's where I got the functional concepts of what is an account, what is a lead, opportunity. So those things uh, carried forward uh, in terms of the business entities that are needed for a typical CRM system. And uh, after that, I was focused primarily on integration and data space. So I did tons of workflow creations, writing scripts back then uh, in, as a developer on Siebel where if you look at it uh, from concepts, if it's taken integration, for example, if you have a CRM system and you have a backend that is an account master, you want to be able to send the account information from your CRM system to the backend, regardless of whether it's Salesforce, whether it's Siebel, whether it's PeopleSoft, the integration needs three things. One is from the place you trigger, what is that message going to look like? Do you need to transform it? What's going to be the middle layer for that? And then at the receiving end, would the message be accepted in the way, or do you need to do some additional logic? And that stays the same, right? Uh, if you think about it conceptually, if the requirement is you need to be able to do it real time as soon as the user hits the button we all know that's a synchronous transaction and this is very um, very basic example you wouldn't do it differently just because you're on salesforce because your everything is driven off what the user need is what does the user want in a typical business scenario what is the user experience what is the expectation and then you just model that into whatever technology stack you're building as part of it Sure. So, so that that is that is how I would approach it. Uh, there were also some questions around, hey, if I'm not technical, can I still attempt it? Absolutely, because again, in the review board, nobody's asking you, hey, show me the line of apex of whether you have bulkified your code or not. It's not. It doesn't go into that level. It's only about if a user wants to pay the bill, what is the best way to do it, right? So that's again very conceptual. So I would argue if someone says that you need to be super technical. You just need to be super solid in your fundamentals when it comes to different aspects of the platform. Sure, nice. Um, and Sebastian, this one for you. So um, obviously you, uh, you would assess a lot of people through your business um, as to whether or not they're right, for, right and ready for the architecture review board. Um, in my role, I see a lot of people that use the architect title but might not necessarily be an architect. So when, when do you feel someone um, has earned the right to be called an architect? Wow. <laughs> an easy one for me. Um, <laughs> so let, let's actually start with the definition of architecture and how it differentiates from design. Uh, because I think very often when someone labels themselves as an architect and we look at the job description, it's more like design, you know? So, Architecture is about principles, about structure and governance. So you want to make sure that you have a framework available. I'm not talking here about like an architectural framework, but also a solution framework in which you can then fit individual design decisions. You know? um, I think if your responsibility um, is at least partially in defining those, um, being an, you are fulfilling an architectural role and you could, you could label yourself. If you, however, are just kind of using uh, a predefined framework from someone who has defined it, no? um, or if you're not applying principles, et cetera, et cetera, it's more about solution design. And it's not about one being better compared to the other. It's just a differentiation. Um, yes, I'm not going to, to say my, my point of view on the title architect and the certifications because it's misleading, but um, yeah. 
No, I, I definitely get that. I think a lot of people that have done solution design put themselves in the architect category. So that's really interesting insight that, that you can provide there. Um, and this one can, can be answered by um, any of you, but um, when you were preparing for your CTA um, review board or going through the journey, did any of you have people management or people leadership uh, responsibilities at that time? And if so, did that kind of... Um, was that detrimental or did that help in your journey? Um, I, I vaguely recall I had some people responsibilities, not a lot, uh, because I was an individual contributor working at a customer project, large scale implementation at an insurance customer. Um, I, I don't think it matters because we are not judging based on whether you can lead people or how good you are as a manager or a leader. Uh, for me, what it took away was obviously some time from family on the weekend. So you have to be very sure once you sign up, you're talking to whoever it is in your household and setting the expectation that you would be spending say eight Saturdays back to back for prepping and you need that support. And as long as you have that support, um, you know, you, you're good to go. Um, I don't think it's it's difficult to prepare while you're at work because obviously work, you have your work duty, work priorities, but weekends, one, especially Saturday mornings, like I would just block four hours, uh, come into this room. Actually, the blackboard that you see at the back was the time when I was uh, attempting for the CTA. That's when I purchased it and just kept, trying, trying, you know, getting my concepts clear. So um, it, it's irrelevant in terms of whether you were a uh, people manager or not. Sure. Yeah, the, the question comes because we see a lot of people that are hesitant to take on that kind of role in their preparation. Um, but I think your answer around the fact that, you know, actually studying for it during, like, as part of your role, isn't the best time to be doing it, you need to be spending your weekends. So Therefore, people shouldn't be turning away opportunities like that, I guess, if, if that's right. just part of what the responsibilities would be. Yep. Um, so ben, can I jump into on that one? Sure. Uh, at the time I was preparing for a CTA, no, I didn't have anybody reporting to me. If I look back at my career, there's times where I was an individual contributor, uh, especially in the early days, member of a technical team. There's times where I was in a management role, where I was purely managing people. And there's times where I had elements of both. And I'll say the time where I was trying to be technical and managing people, uh, the people that were reporting to me suffered uh, because I, I found that I couldn't do both well. And I found I found I fell back on what I'd like to do. Right. And I'd like to do the technical things. So I would put more emphasis on figuring out what needed to be done technology wise than spending the time making sure that my people were successful. So I would I would keep your tendencies in mind when you're thinking about taking that on. Is, is that going to be something that gives you energy and then you have time in the evenings or the mornings to do CTA or is it going to be a drain on your energy so that you don't uh, have what you need to put into it because Prisma is absolutely right. You need to be committed yourself to doing this. You need to have the commitment of your family because there are sacrifices that need to be made. And I do think you need to have the commitment of your organization uh, and that may be giving you time in order to be successful. If you're working 60 hour weeks, you're not going to have anything left to try and put in to prepare for the CTA. Sure. Yeah, nice. Um, and Carl, my, my next question was actually coming straight back to you because you've done a lot of work sure. in product companies, um, yeah. which is, is quite different from working on um, services and, and implementing uh, solutions for various different clients. So when you were preparing for the CTA review board, um, where did you identify your gaps were in your preparation? As in, um, you know, this, this was an area I hadn't worked with or perhaps I needed more coverage. And how did you then address that? When, when I look at it, I probably did not have as much big project experience as your typical CTAs or, or people that go to the review board. But I've been in a lot of smaller companies and really have developed the mindset of the answer comes from me. And that doesn't mean I know everything and I'm going to give you an answer on the spot. But if I don't know, I'm going to find out. There, there isn't somebody else to rely on to say, oh, well, you know, you go get this question answered for me. So having that mentality of needing to find the answer, even if it requires research or talking to other people, whatever method I have, I think that helped me fill in a lot of the places where 
I might not have been strong. So coming in, the identity and security wasn't an area that I had spent a ton of time in. So making sure that I, I practiced and went down to a level that it made sense to me from a very technical flow of what is an HTTP request looks like so that I could understand it at the right level of the review board. So just reflecting on those areas from, from my experiences. Sure. Um, Sebastian, over to you. You, um, you prepare a lot of people for the CTA review board. Um, and until you face it, I guess you have real, like until you go in there and you sit down and, and you, you're given your requirement um, or given the, 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 um, the work to, to work on, you've really got kind of no idea if you haven't gone through that mentoring or guidance as to what to expect. So how do you prepare um, aspiring CTAs? How, how do you liken the CTA review board to something they may face in their day-to-day -day job? Okay, so first of all, I, th I think we can all agree that the CTA review board exam as such is an artificial environment because let's be honest, um, none of us will ever face a situation where we're presented with a 10 page business case where we got three hours time to prepare on our own without getting any input, okay? Um, so in that sense, I think there is no direct correlation to uh, to real world situations. However, if you're actually taking it apart, there most definitely is. So um, I think the exam itself kind of resembles an RFP to an extent where you really have to scan through like a holistic set of requirements and come up with like a high level solution without understanding all the necessary details. Um, it resembles a pre-sales meeting or like it is like an engagement workshop with one of your clients. Uh, so those would be probably the two main real world situations where the exam has a connection to. And I think in terms of preparation, um, what I see is that a lot of people that are preparing for the exam, um, how do I put this? I'm, I'm missing the English term here, but uh, it's almost like when they're working with someone, they get pampered, you know, like pe when people are teaming up to do mock scenarios, they are, they're not going hard, but that's effectively what's going to happen on the board, especially when you have Carl as a judge, you know, he's going to, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no, Carl is a nice guy, but, uh, you know, like I, I heard a couple of things that you go really into detail because you have this drive of, you want to know, yeah? and I guess like you also want to know if they know. Um, so in that sense, it's, when you do the preparation for the board uh, with your peers, don't go easy on them. Yeah? Because after all, there's no point in, in having like all this happy feeling uh, before you attempt the board. And then actually you sit or like you face the judges and they kind of start banging you with questions and you just break because you're not uh, used to that kind of pressure, which is why I go really hard on my students. Not because I'm mean, but because I want, to, I want them to be prepared to what to come, that it's easier. Sure. Yeah, so just setting the reality and, and making them. Uh, yeah. yeah, I guess if you walk in and you've not had that reality set, it's going to be a real, uh, a real eye opener. Yes, yes. Um, and I'm going to stay with you, Sebastian, because uh, Karishma mentioned earlier about the, the, you know, don't necessarily need to be a developer, and, and you're proof of that. But how much, how much does someone need to know about code if they're going to approach the CTA? I, I, I learned coding, so I'm, I was per se a developer, but. Um, Here's the thing, and uh, some people might have seen that, that post on LinkedIn where we kind of had the discussion, do you need to be a developer? There are two answers to that. Uh, you don't, but you should probably. Uh, you, sh you don't in the sense of nobody's has, has said, you don't really need to know uh, code line by line. But I think just with the title and with the expectation of the role that you're able to to work with a team of developers. I think if you don't have like a solid understanding of what they are actually doing and you, you can't really guide them on a conceptual level, which kind of gets us back to the concepts um, of understanding code as well. It's, uh, you're not getting the full picture, let's put it that way. So I would, I would suggest understanding code at least. Sure. By the way, I, uh, I can't I develop lightning, so. <laughs> You know, but I understand it. I can, I can guide my, my developers and I can tell them, this is what I expect. This is how it needs to work, et cetera, et cetera. 
Sure. And uh, Karishma, so um, pretty much I, I would guess that most people that are on this, um, this stream are aspiring or, or want to, to one day become a CTA, at least a good percentage of them. But what does a CTA actually do? Um, so so you're, you're a CTA, you work at Salesforce. What does your day look like? Um, so I have actually changed quite a bit of roles ever since I became a CTA. So back then when in 2015, when I was prepping for it, I was uh, working on as a program architect. So I was on multiple customers, just uh, recommending how to best architect a Salesforce implementation when the implementation was being done by someone else. Um, and then I expanded into obviously different domains. So financial services, health cloud, but I stayed primarily like an advisor architect uh, kind of capacity till 20, 2019. Last year, I actually switched roles and I became a product manager. So now I'm on the other side where I'm actually building products um, as part of enterprise scale solutions. And what helped me being a CDA is because I have been on the field, because I've seen customer problems, because I have spent weekends trying to deploy Salesforce implementations and lived through the nightmare of what could go wrong with a bad design. Um, I now have a better understanding of what are these enterprise customers really looking for. And that way it makes me a better product manager because I have those insights. So it helps me just understand and not be stuck in a bubble of, okay, a product should be this versus this is what our customers are really doing with Salesforce. Um, and that's how much deep you need to be you know, in terms of building a product. So that way now in this role, I take that knowledge and I still continue to learn. Um, uh, rightly so, you know, once you get it doesn't mean that you're all gold and you, nobody can question you. In fact, I get challenged on a day-to-day -day basis. I still work with customers, um, understanding what scale challenges they would have. And there are days when someone will ask me a question and I need to really go back and understand what are they talking about simply because the product changes three times a year. So we need to just keep updating our knowledge as we go. It's a never ending learning process. Sure. And uh, Carl, what about for yourself? Um, you're obviously not um, working for Salesforce, you're, you're external. So what does your day look like? I would say, do you, do you like having conversations with people and building PowerPoints? Because as an architect, you may be doing a lot of that. And, and I think that's an important place to start, right? Is the term architect can mean a lot of different things. You can be a solution architect, you can be an application architect, you can be security, data. I know we have the word certified technical architect in, in our certification title, but in many ways it's more of a, an enterprise architect where it's looking at requirements and having some conversations with people to understand what the solution is, building a solution, presenting that solution, defending it with, with questions, uh, not necessarily going in and doing code reviews and looking at apex or lightning components every day so it, it definitely while it has an element of technical it may not be as hands-on deep into a stack as somebody is thinking looking at that journey so i would encourage everybody to, to think about well who who do you see as an architect what type of roles are they in okay it's a program architect at Salesforce, or it's an enterprise architect at a big consulting firm, and really understand what that job is, because it can differ. It can differ greatly based off of uh, the company and where they, they have that person set up. Great. And um, the, the final question, just before we go to some of the questions that we've been asked, is um, if you could all recommend some resources that you, that you used and were, were helpful um, in your journey. Uh, in, obviously, there is a lot on Trailhead. There are blogs, but I think for me, what worked more than uh, reading is actually doing a lot of conceptual sessions with the experts. So, for example, if a single sign-on was something I was not comfortable with, I would validate. I would take one-hour slots from the architects who were already CTAs in my organization, block some time and make sure that I'm getting the right uh, expertise in those areas where 
I need to grow as an architect. So that definitely helped. And it's only when you get in front of the experts, do you know how deep they can go when it comes to second level, third level of questioning. Now, because you might have an opinion that you read this and you passed this trail and you know it, but when it comes to reality and when it added with all the time management that you need to do as part of review board, it, it can get really challenging to think quickly on your feet. So I would definitely recommend talking to more people while you prep was the biggest thing. And Carl? For me, and I was going to verify that this is still still there, what I found was there was a, a couple of courses that were, were free. They were called Application Architect and System Architect. I believe they're in the architect community on, on the resources on the left. But what they did is they brought together the concepts. In, in everything leading up to the CTA, you have these individual silos, right? I do a designer exam. I do app builder. I do identity. These two courses really helped me look at things more holistically of how your choice in an object model can affect large data volumes and security and then how you integrate. So those to me were, were a really good learning resource that sometimes is often overlooked to help pull things together. And finally, Sebastian. Um, <clears throat> I have to admit like uh, back in the days we didn't have trial heads. So. So I would very much rely on PDFs. But here's the thing, and uh, I think that kind of expands what Karishma was talking about, like talking to the experts and uh, second and third level questioning. So, so here's, a, here's a technique that I use with my, with my guys to help them really understand the content. It's called the Feynman technique. And it just means that you're breaking down uh, a concept into simple terms. So if you talk about single sign-on, you know, like you have uh, you have the sample assertion token, et cetera, et cetera, you actually start breaking this concept down till you can explain every element in that concept in simple terms without depending on technology or like without using another descriptive term, you know? So when you say, oh, how does single sign-on work? Oh, I have an identity provider, I have a service provider, I have a sample assertion token that gets exchanged. You break it down, what is a service provider? What is an identity provider? Now you could say, oh, identity provider is connected to, to an active directory or like an LDAP system. What is that? What is that? So that really helps you to break those things down. And once you've, once you've got to the point where there's no more concept to break down, you really have understood it. Perfect. Um, so we've got three minutes left. So I'm going to try and get uh, through as many questions as possible. Um, so if we just kind of maybe answer one each. Um, the first one I'm, I'm picking is Susanna. So um, do you feel you need to have really strong memorization skills? I'm a good learner, but definitely do not have a photographic memory. I, I don't think photographic memory uh, holds good either, uh, considering when you come in front of the review board and you see, back then it was five people, now I guess it's three. Uh, that many pair of eyes directly looking at you and asking you whatever you even know you forget. <laughs> so so mm -hmm. it's, it's more about, I, I think apart from all, whatever we've talked so far, one critical thing is not to uh, lose your nerves because that can overpower all the knowledge that you have uh, and all the work that you've put in if you can't hold good in terms of your time management skills, your uh, anything related to your exam phobias or whatever you have around the environment itself that it creates. Um, I, I don't believe, um, Susanna, that's uh, a necessary skill to have it, as long as you can perform under pressure and um, break it into easier words, as Ben said. Um, and Carl, I'm going to throw this one at you. So Sharanya, um, once you achieve CTA, do you get to work hands-on? It's going to depend upon your role. Um, yes, I, this week I wrote some batch Apex in a customer's org as well as some process builders and then also build a project plan of how we're going to deploy our solution along with theirs. So big variety of skill sets this week. It's just going to depend on the specific job you get, but it's possible. And then finally, um, Sev, this one for you. Uh, what do people think of the CTA prep time being increased by one hour and how would people use that extra time? I, I don't know who, 
which people are referring to what they're thinking about. So let me, um, let me, let me generalize that. If you are prepared for the video board, that additional hour gets you more confidence. You have more time to actually reflect on the solution that you have prepared and that you're about to present and, and kind of change some of the mistakes that you would probably come across as part of your QA. If you're not ready, doesn't matter, doesn't matter if you have like three hours, four or five hours, you're not ready. Okay. Uh, because we're coming back to the concepts like if you, like with those three hours, you now have really a good buffer to go through this entire scenario. And those who ha would have failed before, but now pass are probably the ones that were just struggling with the time constraints. Because after all, like um, we all have different kinds of brain types and process information in a different speed. Again, like not, nothing good or bad about it. It's just what it is. So I think it's good for, for those candidates. Yeah. But you should still be, be prepared. And Carl, can I interject one thing? Yeah, I think it also helps. Um, you had to be a pretty fast reader and be able to consume information quickly. I think that the extra hour helps a little bit if you're not the fastest reader out there. So it gives you a little bit less pressure in how fast you read. Perfect. I think that's, uh, that's all the time we have. So thank you very much, guys. Thanks for the questions. Um, and yeah, thank you uh, for, for uh, your time. Thank yeah, you and that, thanks, Ben. Yeah. And I want to, th to say thank you for being uh, awesome uh, supporters of community and joining this first uh, virtual dreaming panel discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Have a good one. Enjoy the tacos. I, they got <laughs> delivered. Like, I'm going to have them now. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks, everybody.